I'm going to invite you, if there's any uh, room around you, between you and the people around you, can you kind of scoot together a little bit? We've got people still standing in the back, and, and they don't want to hear this, but there's like a row right here in the front where nobody's see, sitting. <laughs> and, uh, and you guys are welcome to fill it up. About, you know, five of you really comfortably can sit there, but uh, if you've got some space where people can fit, that would be really nice to, to share that. Hey, if uh, you'll turn in your Bibles or your Bible apps to Luke chapter 22, uh, we're going to be continuing our Just Jesus series today. And if uh, you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the, the ones in the pews around you that look like this. Turn to page 1,122, and uh, you will find Luke chapter 22. If you need a Bible, you want to read God's Word and you don't have one, then take one of these with you. Uh, and it's yours. It's our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God and be able to read the Word of God. Hey, here at Calvary, we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of His people and the power of His truth. And uh, I just wanted to share with you that there are uh, three opportunities coming up the next three weekends uh, for you to be able to lead people to Jesus, uh, opportunities to lead them to life change. And I don't want you to miss out on that, but a lot of times there's so much going on that it's easy for us to miss it. So uh, next weekend is the Colorado River Celebration with Will Graham out at the rodeo grounds. And that's going to be Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday evening. And uh, it's just a great opportunity, opportunity if you have a friend that, that just doesn't want to go to church, but you want them to hear some great music and hear some, uh, a great message about how Christ can change your life, then that's an opportunity that you have. The following weekend, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the 20th, 21st, 22nd, we're doing the Passion Play right here. And again, it, it's, uh, it's not preachy, it's just a depiction of the life death, and resurrection of Jesus, and, and uh, it's a great opportunity for you to bring a friend. And then, of course, the week after that is Easter. And uh, I know some of you are going, how are we going to bring friends on Easter? This place is packed. Here's the answer. We need about half of you to come Saturday night. <laughs> and, uh, and then you can do, you know, special stuff on Easter uh, morning, but uh, we seriously, we get closer, we'll ask some of you just to commit, come Saturday night. Let's pack the place out Saturday night. That way we have room for guests on uh, Sunday, so you can bring your friends on Easter Saturday and freak them out a little bit and go, who does Easter on Saturday? Well, we do, okay? It's just today. It's Easter someplace, right? Uh, anyway, hey, changing gears. Have you guys ever been in a, uh, a restaurant or a, a grocery store or a public place and watched a child, usually a young one like a toddler, just melt down yeah, we've all seen that, haven't we? You know, they, they don't get their way. They're upset about something, and they go full on temper tantrum, hissy fit, drop to the floor, kicking and screaming and crying and yelling, and I want this, and I don't go here, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I have this theory that, that there are certain thoughts that go through all of our minds at the same time when we see that. Let me test this out. So if you're a younger parent, you've got some little kids of your own, the first thought that goes to your mind is, thank God that's not my child. <laughs> right? And, and then it's kind of followed up with the poor parents, uh, you know, because you know that what they're struggling with. If you're a little bit older, then your, your first thought is, um, I really hope that uh, you get a handle on that now, because if you don't, the teenage years are going to be a nightmare. <laughs> right? A lot of you better figure that out now because they're still young and you're still bigger than they are. Uh, and, and if you're, you know, uh, older, like a grandparent age or something like that, you're probably thinking, give me five minutes with that child and I'll give them a reason to cry. <laughs> right? It's a different world we live in, folks, but, uh, you know, those thoughts are still there. I wonder, though, does anybody, when you see that happening, you see that child having that full-on meltdown, do you ever just think, hey, I know exactly how they feel? Yeah. See, honestly, we do. We actually do understand how that child feels when they're throwing that temper tantrum, when they're having that hissy fit, because a lot of times we feel the same way. That, that child is reacting, usually in the way that they think is going to, to make them feel better or get what they want, so it's a learned kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, to, to demonstrate or express their dissatisfaction with the way that life is happening with the way that life is turning out. They're not getting what they want. They're not going where they want to go. Things are not happening the way that they feel like they want them to happen. And so they express that inner frustration in a very immature outward way. 
And the truth is we understand how that child feels because we see the world around us and a lot of times we get frustrated. Right? The world's not happening the way we think it should happen. Things are not occurring the way that, that we want them to occur. We don't get stuff that we want. A lot of times we don't get to go where we want to go. And, and we really feel that way when someone makes us do something we don't want to do. Only we've learned that dropping to the floor and kicking and screaming doesn't really gain you anything. So we don't do that. But we still know what that child's feeling. See, that's where our passage takes us today in the Easter story. We get a glimpse of Jesus in a very uncomfortable, tense moment where he has to do what he doesn't want to do. And, and as Jesus followers, we can learn how we're supposed to live by looking at Jesus. Luke 22, beginning at verse 39, uh, let me just uh, bring you up to speed on what's happened. This is the, the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. It's Thursday night of Holy Week. Uh, he's just celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples. He instituted the Last Supper, uh, where we uh, get our communion celebrations from. And, and, uh, and he's told the disciples that one of them is going to betray him. They got upset about that. He's told them they're all going to abandon him. They protested. He told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. All that's happened, and now they're leaving, and they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where the story picks up. Verse 39, Luke 22, and it says... And Jesus came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. I want to share with you four thoughts from the garden. Today, just four ideas that I pray that you will think about all week long, that, that you'll talk about in your life groups, that you'll really just kind of meditate on and allow God to help you become more like Jesus. Four things we learn from the garden. The first thing in the garden we see is the agony of obedience. The agony of obedience. Um, you see, we know that we're supposed to obey God. That, that's kind of a given. You guys are in church, so most of us get the idea that we're supposed to obey what God says. And, and if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then the expectation is obedience, right? Because we confess Jesus as our Lord, our master, our king. And so when he says do this, we're supposed to embrace that and do it. We're supposed to obey. But sometimes obedience is agonizing. And we just need to acknowledge that. Because the truth is, Jesus didn't want to die. He didn't want to die. Look at verse 42. In the passage, it says... Jesus prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He doesn't want to go through this. He wants another way. Jesus doesn't want to endure the, the torture and the humiliation and the pain of the crucifixion. And so he asked the Father, give him another way. In verse 44, it actually says, and being in agony... He prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. He was in agony because he didn't want to go through this. So here's the question that, that I hope will haunt you all week long. How are you going to respond when God's will takes you where you don't want to go? How are you going to respond when the will of God is for you to do something that you don't want to do? Because it's going to happen. 
It happened to Jesus, the one that we follow. And Jesus obeyed, reluctantly, in agony, but he obeyed. So just know this, following Jesus isn't easy. I think sometimes uh, Christian leaders kind of present the idea that following Jesus is going to be real easy. If you just embrace Jesus, it's all going to be sunshine and roses, and, and he's going to heal your life, and he's going to fix your problems, and, and, and he's going to just always you know, make everything better. And, and here's the thing. Jesus will make your life better. He will heal. He will bring redemption to bear on your life. But, but here's the thing. It isn't easy. And if we tell people that it's easy, then we're misrepresenting what Jesus himself said. Right, Because in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, same gospel, here's what Jesus said. And Jesus said to all, to all of us, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Uh, Self-denial. Embracing an implement of torture and death. This is a challenge to us. And this is hard. That following Jesus is not easy. Now, understand, I desperately want everyone to follow Jesus. I mean, the whole mission of Calvary is about leading people to Jesus. Uh, and, and personally, I want people to follow Jesus because Jesus is the only way to life. Jesus is the only one who can give you eternal life. He's the only one to take you to heaven. He's the only one who can forgive you of all your sins. It's only Jesus. But at the same time that I want you to know that and follow Jesus, I want everyone to know that following Jesus isn't easy. It's not all fun and games. It's not always a party. It's not always a pleasure. You see, God asked his children to do unpleasant, difficult things. How many of you were ever in a family? (laughs) Yeah, most of you. I kind of figured that. And uh, in your family, when you were growing up, did you have to do chores? Yeah. Did you always like the chores? No. <laughs> Somebody say they love them. <laughs> All right. We have to talk afterwards. <laughs> it's called denial. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in doing the chores, some of them were not so bad. And some of them, let's face it, we hated them, right? You, you just groaned inside when your parents said, okay, here's your chores for the day. Or here's your chores for the week. So what were your least favorite chores? How many of you hated cleaning the toilets? Yep, the hands go up. Some of you still do. That's why you don't have company come over. Uh, how about dishes? Who hates the di- doing the dishes? Okay, vacuuming. We got people who hate vacuuming. How come the same people are raising their hands for everything? Because they're like me. I just hate chores in general. That's a terrible word. Should be four letters. Um, but, uh, you know, I, pulling weeds. Who hates pulling weeds? Yeah, that's why we have children, right? So they can pull the weeds, do the dishes, all that kind of stuff. You know, my least favorite was cleaning out the garage. When my dad said we're cleaning out the garage, I knew right then and there it destroyed the whole day. Because we had big garages packed full of stuff, not cars. We had to, like, move all the stuff out, clean it out, do all the stuff, put it all back in the same spot. Couldn't tell any difference by the end of it. (laughs) Wasted the day. Hated that. Here's the thing. We did that stuff because we were part of a family. And our family had expectations, and we were part of that. And so sometimes our families ask us to do things that we didn't like. Difficult things, unpleasant things. If you're part of God's family, then he's going to ask you, his child, to do things that are unpleasant and difficult. Like loving your enemies. There's not one of us in here that wants to love our enemies. No, I mean, they're enemies. We want to hurt them. We don't want to love them. And yet Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. It's a family thing. We love our enemies. He he asks us to do other things that are difficult, like tithe. See, God actually has the audacity to ask us to give him 10% of our income. You see, he gave us everything that we have, and he wants us to give him back 10% so that we can honor him as God and recognize that he's the one who provides. It's not easy. He asks us to do it. He asks us to forgive in the same way that we've been forgiven by him. By the way, Jesus forgave us of all our sins, which means that we're supposed to forgive people of all their offenses against us. 
And yeah, we don't want to forgive. We want to hold on and, and, and you know, let nurse that bitterness, that anger. We want to get revenge. And yet, we're supposed to forgive. And, and God asks us to forgive because it's going to bless us if we forgive. It's not going to you know, be for their benefit. It's for our benefit. He asks us to serve ungrateful people. You know, here at Calvary, we, we want to serve people. We serve our community. Uh, we love doing that. And it is so wonderful when you're out serving people and they thank you, isn't it? They smile and they're all happy. Oh, you guys are so great. Thanks for doing this and everything. It's a whole lot less fun to serve people who are grumpy, right? Who are ungrateful, who complain about stuff. Hey, want a free hot dog? I don't like hot dogs. What are you doing? Give me a hot dog. You got anything else? No. You can go to Burger King down the street. Get whatever you want. It's a hot dog. You want it? Yeah, you know, we, we serve, and, and, yet, and yet here's the thing. Jesus doesn't say just serve people who like you, who are grateful. And he showed us what it looked like at the Last Supper, right? Because he got down on his hands and knees, and he washed the disciples' feet as an example. And guess who one of those disciples was whose feet Jesus washed? Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. And Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him in just a few hours. And yet he still got down and he served the man who was going to hand him over for the crucifixion. You see, God asks his children to do unpleasant, difficult things. And in the garden, we see the agony of obedience and we see the danger of temptation. Look at verse 40 and verse 46. The beginning and the end of this passage, it says, And when Jesus came to the place... He said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Verse 46, and Jesus said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. He bookends the passage with this warning about praying so that you don't enter temptation. So that tells us that prayer is the key to overcoming temptation. Why? Why is prayer so important if we want to overcome temptation? Because prayer is talking to God. Now, prayer is not just reciting some words over and over and over again. It is having a conversation with the living God where you are expressing your your hopes and your dreams, your fears, your failures, all of that to God. And you're listening and, and, and it's a dynamic relationship to where you are learning who God is and you're learning to trust God because you're communicating with him. And the closer that you get in relationship to Jesus, the less likely we are to blatantly disobey God. That's just a reality. Because our obedience is not connected to our knowledge. Think about this. Uh, We all pretty much know right and wrong. I mean, this room filled with people. We understand right and wrong. Uh, More or less, we, we know the right things to do, the wrong things to do. And yet we still disobey God. We still engage in behavior that we know this is wrong. It's not because we don't know it. It's because proximity inspires obedience more than knowledge. Example. Um, Anybody else in this room have an issue uh, exceeding this posted speed limit like I do? Okay. (laughs) Confession is good for the soul. Go ahead and put the hands up. It's it's all good. And and if you didn't raise your hand, you're probably married to somebody who uh, did. So uh, you're always telling them to slow down. See, here's the thing. I drive fast, and, I, and I, it's not because I don't know the speed limit. I know what the posted speed is. Most of the time, I'm aware of that. That does not influence how I drive. But if, perchance, I happen to see a, a nice, friendly law enforcement vehicle by the side of the road or traveling you know, on, the, on the road the same direction I am, it's amazing how suddenly I am motivated to do what? Slow down, yeah. It's not because my knowledge has changed. It's because now I am in proximity to somebody who can hold me accountable. And I don't want to have a conversation with them at that point in time. So the proximity changes my obedience to the law, not my knowledge. We're the same way with Jesus. When we're not close to Jesus, when we're not talking to him, when we're ignoring him throughout the day, then we are much more likely to disobey him, even though we know the right thing to do, than we are if we're walking 
hand in hand with him, if he's close to us, if we're having that conversation, if we're talking to God and we're close to God, then we're more likely to obey God. You see, every one of us faces temptation to do what we want instead of God's will, to avoid the pain, to take the easy path, to be selfish, to promote ourselves, to keep the money, to hold on to hate. That's why we encourage you to pray. Pray in the morning. Pray throughout the day. Pray at work. Pray when you're in the car. Pray in your meetings. Pray with your children. Pray so that you can draw close to Jesus and you will not enter into temptation because we are weak. We are weak. The disciples were weak. Did you catch that? Verse 45. And when Jesus rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. Sleeping. They were weak. They were tired. They were exhausted. Maybe they were depressed. I mean, they'd had a crazy week. I mean, they came into Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna and blessed is the king. And and they thought this is going to be awesome. And then Jesus, you know, debated with the religious leaders throughout the week. And then here they celebrate the Passover. And Jesus tells them, I'm going to die. And you're going to betray me. And you're going to deny me. And and, and they're, they're upset. And they take a nap. They're worn out. And so they weren't ready for the temptation that came. Because what happens right after the garden? Judas shows up with the soldiers. He betrays Jesus into their hands. And the disciples in their moment of temptation fail. They all run away afraid. They were weak. And we are weak. Each one of us in our own way. We're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. I'm vulnerable. Do you know what my my prayer is on a regular basis? God, thank you for the ministry that you're doing through Calvary. Help me not to screw it up. Because I understand I'm weak. I'm vulnerable. And, and, And we need to know our weaknesses so that we can protect ourselves through prayer through life group participation, through accountability, through Bible reading and serving and avoiding the dangerous places and people that want to lead us astray. But we've got to be close to Jesus if we're going to do that. So in the garden, we see the agony of obedience. We see the danger of temptation. And we see the strength from God. Verse 43, right in the middle of this passage, it says, and there appeared to Jesus an angel from heaven strengthening him. In the midst of Jesus' agony, as he's crying out to the Father for another path, the Father sends an angel to him. That is so cool, isn't it? Do you ever feel like you could use a visit from an angel? Yeah, we could. Hey, you know what? I'm pretty sure that in our darkest times, God sends one of his messengers to us. Maybe an angel, maybe somebody else, another one of his servants to, uh, to, uh, to give us strength. But notice this, because this is really important when we're talking about the angel coming and ministering to Jesus and everything. The angel encouraged Jesus. He did not rescue. The angel encouraged, but he didn't rescue. See, Jesus continued to agonize about the Father's will to the point of, of sweating like drops of blood. Jesus continued struggling with the cost of obedience. And see this, Jesus asked the Father for another way. Isn't there another path? Isn't there another way we can do this? And the father sent him an angel to say, no, there's not another way. But I'm with you and you can do this. And he strengthened him. He encouraged him. But he didn't rescue him. See, so often in our dark times, we cry out to God, don't we? We cry out to God to rescue us from the pain, rescue us from the sorrow, save us from the agony that is ahead of us. And if we're honest, a lot of times we're disappointed, maybe even angry at God when he offers us his strength but refuses to rescue us. We get broken and we want God to fix it in our time, in our way, And I know people who, because God didn't rescue them and only offered his strength, they lost their faith and they walked away from God, they walked away from the church because God didn't do what they wanted. 
And I want you to see this because God didn't do what his own son wanted. He offered him strength but not rescue. So today, God will give you strength for the battle that you are facing. That's his promise. And he wants you to know that he sees your struggle and he is with you and he will never, ever abandon you. God will see you through the battle. He will not rescue you from the battle. And we need to know that if we're going to win the battle. So in the garden, we see the agony of obedience. We see the danger of temptation. We see the strength provided by God. And finally, I hope you can see that victory is achieved through submission. Victory is achieved through submission. Again, go back to verse 42. This is the the heart of this passage. Jesus prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And and I want you to understand that victory is achieved when we submit to God. You see, Jesus achieved the victory when he embraced the Father's will over his own. Now, Jesus realized the victory on the cross when he said at the end in the Gospel of John, it is finished. It is finished is a cry of victory, a cry that the battle has been won. It's a declaration that that, that Jesus has conquered because at that point he paid for your sins and my sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could become sons and daughters of God. But nobody realized that victory except Jesus. See, the victory wasn't made public until Easter morning, right? Right? When they found the empty tomb, when Jesus appeared to the disciples and they understood that Jesus was alive and that now everything has changed because Jesus has defeated death and we no longer are held captive to that fear of death. He's offered us life eternal and so we can live boldly, courageously. We can love like God called us to love. It changes everything when we realize Jesus has defeated death. But the garden is the moment where the battle is decided. When Jesus says, Father, your will, not my will, be done. Now, I made an assumption I think is correct. Uh, We all want to win, right? You guys all want to win? See, I've never met anyone yet who said, hey, my goal in life is to be a lifelong loser. (laughs) Anybody going to change that? No, see, some of us have achieved that, but it wasn't our goal. You see, we all want to win. We want to be victorious. We want to be the champions. And I want you to know today that the only way to victory in your life is by submitting to the will of God. It's when we choose to surrender to God's plan and take God's path instead of our own. And this is where the battle happens in our lives, literally on a daily basis, where we're in the garden and we want to do it our way, and yet God is calling us to a different path. See, we bring God our dreams and our hopes, and we say, God, we want you to bless our plans. And God says, no, I want you to surrender your plans. I've got better ones. And we come to God and we say, God, here's how I want life to work out. And God says, no, why don't you lay down your plans for life and and you embrace my plans for life and it'll be so much better for you. I'll lead you to victory. And honestly, until we can pray, Father, you know what I want, but not my will, your will be done. We will never live in that consistent place of victory. And that means to get to that point of surrender means that we have to trust God. You see, we can't submit to God unless we trust God. And we trust God and and we trust his promises, that they are true. That we trust God with our lives, with our careers. How about with our happiness? This is a big point where we struggle because we all think we know what it's going to take to make us happy, right? Because you've all got your wish list in your head someplace, right? If I just could do this, if I could achieve this, if I could accomplish this, if I could have this much money, then I'd be happy. 
And those are all lies. Those things won't make us happy even when we achieve them or accomplish them or gain them. But if we will embrace the life of Christ, he will lead us to joy that nothing in this world can take away. But we got to do it God's way, not our way. And it means we got to trust God with our marriages. So often, our prayer is, God, would you please fix my spouse? <laughs> right? Because we want to have a great marriage. We want to be happy. And, we, and, and so we look at the other person. We go, God, you need to fix them. They're, they're messed up. And yet what God is saying, no, what I want you to do is I want you to learn to love your spouse like I love you. And, and I want you to learn to forgive your spouse the way that I've taught you to forgive. And I want you to serve your spouse even when they're ungrateful. And let me change your marriage if you'll trust me. It means that we trust God with our children. And that means trusting him with the lives of our children. Look, this is a big point of struggle. If you've if you got younger kids, even older kids, we, you know, we think we know better than God when it comes to our own children. And there's a lot of parents that love Jesus and yet they think they love their kids more than he does. And the truth is God loves your kids more than you do. And the temptation is for us to try and protect them rather than allow God to guide them in their life and to introduce them to that. And I know this because as a youth pastor and even as a pastor, I've tried to convince parents, hey, send your kid on this mission trip. It's a life-changing opportunity. And, and I've had so many parents say, I, I can't let them go. I'm afraid it's dangerous there. And that's saying, God, we don't trust you with our kids and their lives. It means that we trust God enough to obey even when it hurts. Because we understand that we can trust God enough to go through the pain of the cross so we can experience the power of the resurrection. So we all love the resurrection. Easter, it's great. It's celebrate. Let's get dressed up. Let's, let's tell God how great it is that Jesus is alive and we have victory over death. And that's wonderful. But the only way we celebrate Easter is because the cross happened. Without Jesus' death on the cross, there's nothing to celebrate on Easter morning. And here's the thing. We're followers of Jesus. And he leads us on this journey where we have to face the pain that God wants us to go through so that we can become those sons and daughters that he's called us to be and we can live in the victory that he offers us. Because victory is achieved through submission. So today, some of us are in the garden right now. And we're wrestling with God because he's asking us to do things that we don't want to do. He's asking us to go places we don't want to go. And he's offering us victory through his path, but not through ours. And see, I know that if you're a follower of Christ, then God the Holy Spirit is in you, and he's speaking into your life right now. And he's asking some of you to give up some things that you love, and he's asking others of you to do some things that you don't want to do. Here's the question. What's God asking you to do? And what's your answer to him going to be? See, my prayer I pray that you choose to submit to God's will. I hope that you can really pray, God, you know what I want, but not my will, but your will be done. To do otherwise, honestly, is to live a life of endless temper tantrums. Let's pray. Father, you love us and you are so patient with your children. And today, Lord, we want to hear your voice, even though it may call us to do something we don't want to do. We want to sense your love and your presence in our lives in a powerful way because you are calling us to new things. You're calling us to a life of victory. But we're afraid. So help us to trust you with what we don't know. Help us to follow you like never before. God, give us courage. Make us brave so that when you call us to those new places, we will not flinch, but we will go. We will surrender. We will, we will face the pain so that we can see the glorious victory that you want to give us through your son, Jesus. Lord, make us like him. That is our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and continue worshiping our amazing God.